Good afternoon, everyone. You can hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Okay. All right. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the dean and the organizers for putting together a day filled with interesting talks from a very, very diverse group of people. And it is an absolute pleasure to be here today. My name is Hoda, and I'm going to speak to you about full stack data science at Stitch Fix. So before I get started, show of hands, how many of you have actually heard of Stitch Fix? Yes. Woo. OK, awesome. Um, good to know. Um, so back, back in the day when I was a PhD student at MIT, I knew that by the time I graduated, I would become an expert in finding free food. <laughs> and maybe a little bit of machine learning, but I never thought that I would eventually end up working at an apparel company. But Stitch Fix isn't just any old apparel company. Um, if you haven't heard about it, it's e-commerce. Um, you don't pick out your own stuff. We offer personal styling as a service, except that we use a combination of both algorithms and expert human knowledge to style our clients. How does it work? What does the client experience look like? Well, first things first, if you're a client, we style both men and women, FYI. Um, you can go onto the website and create a style profile. In the style profile, we ask you questions like, what is your size? What is your height? What is your budget? How do you like your fit clothes to fit you? Do you like them a little bit more tighter or do you like them a bit more looser? And the client answers all these questions. The second step is that um, you get five hand-picked items in the mail. What's really neat about Stitch Fix is that although like traditional department stores, we buy and own all our inventory, the difference is that the client doesn't get to browse that inventory. We choose that and the five items for them. So what we look at the information they provided us along with the feedback that they give us based on the items we send them and we choose five items to give them. The next step is that you get to try your clothes in the comfort of your own home. You decide what you want to keep. Then you go back to the website, give us feedback, you tell us how you like the style of every item, what you thought about the fit of every item, and the price point of every item. You can even leave free form feedback for your stylist to read. And then finally, you get to keep what you like and send back what you, uh, whatever you don't like. Um, we pay shipping both ways, so it's free for you. How do we choose which five items we want to send to the client? It's really interesting because it's a mix of both art and science. Our, our clients tell us something about themselves when they sign up, so we have that information. We have information in the form of attributes about our inventory, so what are the colors of the clothing we have? What is the actual measurements of our inventory? But we also have feedback from the clients about what we've sent to them previously. This feedback is implicit in the sense that um, we can see what the client decided to choose to keep and what they returned. And we also have explicit structured feedback, whether the item was too small, too expensive, they didn't like the material. And finally, we have feedback in the form of unstructured comments that our clients leave us. Our algorithms ingest this data, process it, and return it in the form of recommendations. Here's where the art comes in. We don't just take the algorithm's top five most recommended items and send it to the client. Instead, we have a human in the loop. This is our stylist. Having a human in the loop allows us to more holistically leverage unstructured data so that that the client provides us. For instance, clients are able to leave us request notes and share their Pinterest boards with us. And while we've explored NLP and computer vision algorithms to process these, humans are awesome at looking at a Pinterest board and telling you what someone's style is like. <laughs> awesome. Our stylists can also diverge from the algorithm and provide cohesiveness to, to the shipment that we send to the client. The algorithms Objective when it makes those recommendations isn't that it should make a cohesive outfit. It just thinks, let me recommend the top items that I think the client might like. But the stylist has that ability. This is how we mix art and science. But at Stitch Fix, we don't have just one giant recommendation algorithm. We use algorithms throughout the company. 
algorithms are literally stitched into the fabric that makes Stitch Fix. Um, we have lots of algorithms, uh, lots of data scientists. And like at most companies in the Valley, data scientists might build a model and hand it off to engineering to implement it in production. And there are project managers to make sure engineers and data scientists, both the teams are kind of in sync. At Stitch Fix, though, the difference is that we ask our data scientists to also be engineers. In fact, we don't even have a single project manager on the entire team. Um, as a result, we end up having a data science team that's fairly large. That's because our data scientists are full stack and they do it all. They do the machine learning, they do the engineering, and they themselves do the project management. Why do we do this? Why do we take a full stack approach to data science? And that the reason we do it is because iteration is incredibly key to data science. You're constantly improving your models, testing out new hypotheses, and in order to be able to iterate quickly through different models, you need both engineering and data science. Having different teams perform these jobs limits the efficiency of the iteration process. You have to schedule meetings or talk via some slow communication mechanism that introduces a lot of latency. Different teams have different priorities and sprint cycles. I might sit here and be like, oh, this thing only takes an hour. What's taking them so long? Two weeks later, it's still not done because the engineering team has different priorities, different things that they need to take care of. The other thing is, if I don't know anything about engineering, and engineering doesn't know anything about machine learning, there's a loss of context that happens every time you communicate. And this loss of context and communication is really, really immense. Personally, it makes it really hard for me to operate at a pace that I want, and this for me is really frustrating if I have to wait for someone else to get the job done. So in order to be able to, and so why is it that having engineering and data science be two separate organizations done by two separate people um, makes it hard to operate at a slower pace, makes it, makes it, possible, makes it hard to operate at a faster pace? Um, let's talk about pace. <laughs> let's speak about pace. This is me. I am running a race against Usain Bolt and Johan Blake. They are the number one and number two fastest runners in the world. If I were to run a ra race against them tomorrow, against either one of them, I would get totally clobbered. But cuff them together. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Tie one of their legs to the other and they can't beat me. <laughs> this is because not only do you go as slow as the slowest person, but you go even slower because you're cuffed together. In our case, this translates to meetings, email threads, Slack messages. It just takes forever. But, you know, all is also not good when you have the same person own engineering and data science. For myself, sometimes I want to spend more time on the science, on building really cool mathematical models. But then I get stuck having to do engineering support, and that can sometimes be annoying, especially if it's Friday night. Um, it's a trade-off, and in my experience, though, being able to iterate more quickly is the lesser of the two evils. So now that we've discussed some of the reasons why full-stack data science can operate more efficiently compared to the traditional model, of the decoupled teams, let's take a look at the full stack data science lifecycle. It consists of four steps. Number one, collect the data. Then you model the problem, engineer a solution that hopefully works, and finally track the outcome to guide business decisions. As an example, I'll go through one of the problems that my team at Stitch Fix works on. That is a problem of matching clients to stylists. So what's the problem? Excuse me for a second. We have a group of stylists, and for the pr purpose of this presentation, our stylists are superheroes. Saving the world one fashion faux pas at a time. And our clients are Muppets. <laughs> 
and Sesame Street character. I have a very unhealthy obsession with Cookie Monster, so I have to incorporate it in every talk. Um, but our clients are Muppets and Sesame Street characters, and there are far more clients than there are stylists. So every stylist ends up styling multiple clients. What we want to figure out <laughs> is how to match our stylists to our clients so that our clients can be their best self. So whether you want to be Big Bird and you want to be more sporty, or you're like Miss P or Kermit and you want to be more glamorous, or maybe you're like Oscar the Grouch and you're looking for that super fashion forward, edgy outfit for New York Fashion Week. <laughs> we want to be your partner in style. So we'll start with step number one, collecting the data. <laughs> <laughs> So, so these days, big data is so hyped that it seems like unless you're using huge quantities of it, you must be doing something wrong. Dan O'Reilly has this incredibly awesome quote, which most of you have probably already heard of it. If not, then I think it's pretty mandatory reading before you graduate. <laughs> so for some problems, collecting more training data or more creative feature engineering can be helpful. In our case, we quickly realized that having differentiating data, data that competitors don't have access to, is much more valuable. For example, if you think about a typical online retailer, they may have access to basic information about you, maybe some information off of Google Analytics. It tells them your approximate age, maybe your gender, your city, and maybe some other generic facts about you. As a result, the items you're recommended start from something somewhat random, and then each time you search for something, similar items are recommended to you over and over again. Ever bought a pair of pants on Amazon, only to have the same pair of pants with something really similar recommended to you for the next two weeks? It drives me bonkers. The other problem is, you know, with someone like Amazon, for instance, you can explore their entire inventory yourself, so you have no incentive to give them any information about you. At Stitch Fix, we've actually inverted the model. When you sign up, we ask you to fill out a style profile. You can't browse our inventory, so you're actually incentivized to be as accurate and complete in the style profile as possible because that's your best shot at getting us to send you items with the right fit and the right style. Let's think about our matching problem. The hardest part about the matching problem is the cold start problem. So for every new client that signs up, how do you best decide to match them with a stylist? This is where having data where the competition doesn't really matters. Amazon has a lot of data for a lot of people, but we have more explicit data for every single one of our clients. So now you've collected the data. The next step is you want to model the problem using the data you've collected. How do we determine which stylists do a better job at styling a particular client? Let's say you have a tall client like Big Bird. Is Cyborg going to be really good at styling Big Bird because Cyborg is tall? Or is it going to be Robin, who's short but hangs out with Batman all the time and Batman is tall? <laughs> so he knows what works out for, well for Batman. These are really, really hard questions to answer without algorithms. So, <laughs> I love Cookie Monster. Um, from a mathematical perspective, the problem we essentially want to solve is how do we match our clients to stylists in a way that's better than random. So what we do is, the way you can frame the problem is first you can determine the probability of, let's say, your client's satisfaction when you match a particular client with a particular stylist. Then you can use optimization algorithms to maximize the global client satisfaction of all your clients. So now you've modeled your solution. It's time to get your hands dirty and engineer a solution that works. You're all data science geeks, so I know, I, know, I know you know how to hack up a solution in R or Python, but that doesn't work outside your personal Jupyter notebook. <laughs>
and Jupiter is awesome. Jupiter is super awesome. <laughs> Not hating on Jupiter. <laughs> but when you're working at a company, you have to build something that runs efficiently, that breaks rarely, hopefully never, and is easy on the eyes so your collaborators can work well on it as well. Some attributes of a well-engineered system include logging. Log everything. There's no such thing as too much logging. Be smart about logging. Structured logging is better than throwing a million print statements. Tests. Write tests. Lots of them. Unit tests seem trivial, but they are absolute lifesavers. And finally, alerts. Alerts are important. If things break, you got to make sure you can learn about it as fast as possible so you can fix it as fast as possible. Fine tune your alerts because if they fire too often, you'll just start ignoring them. It'll be like the boy who cried wolf. But the most important part of your solution is to have a backup solution. Most people, including myself, had to learn this the hard way. No matter how much confidence you might have in your algorithm, it will break. Have a plan B. Even better, have a plan C. In the matching problem, when our algorithms break, there's an entire organization, this is a styling organization, that can't perform their job. It's better to arbitrarily match clients to stylists than to have the stylists have no work to do at all. Now we have a solution in place, excuse me. And we wanna see how our solution performs. So solving a math problem is really different than solving a business problem in the real world. Things don't always turn out the way you might anticipate it to do so. So it's important to track the outcome of any solution you implement, <coughs> even if you have absolute faith in it. You might wanna iterate on your solution and keep on incrementally improving it. How do you test whether a tweak you made improved the algorithm or not? For that, you need an experimentation platform and to be able to perform A-B tests. But A-B tests can be a tricky beast. For instance, in our matching problem, there are also humans involved who can change our experimental allocation. Let's say we have the hypothesis that if we match clients and stylists who have an affinity for the same color, then perhaps client satisfaction might increase. So what we do is we first divide our stylists into two groups by random, so treatment and control. And in our treatment group, our stylists are matched up with clients who have an affinity for the same client, for the same color, excuse me. But what ends up happening is because at Stitch Fix, we always encourage our stylists to do what's best for the client. Batman might take a look at Miss Piggy and he's like, she's wearing black, which he's a fan of because he's from New York. But he also notices that she's wearing leather. So he reassigns her to Catwoman, who is another New York stylist with a particular affinity for both black and leather. How do you deal with that? <laughs> use in, in, you can use intent to treat methods and instrumental variable methods from econometrics to solve this, but this is an example of how having humans in the loop <laughs> can sometimes complicate things as well. So now, let's say our experiment is complete. And we notice that customer satisfaction has increased with a p-value of 0 0.0001. Shall we bust out the champagne? Man, it is time for a celebration. Not so fast. It's important to note that all the p-value does is give us confidence that client satisfaction really did increase. It wasn't due to chance or sampling error. The problem is that statistically significant differences can be found even with very small differences if your sample sizes are really large. It doesn't mean that the finding itself is significant in practice. Practical significance asks the larger question about differences. Are the differences in the samples big enough to have real meaning? 
practical significance is generally assessed with some measure of effect size. It's always, always, always important to think about your models from a business perspective. No one's going to care whether the coefficients in your model are statistically significant if it doesn't translate to the business. So now we've gone through the end-to-end -end life cycle of a full stack <coughs> data scientist. It's important to note that this model works really well if you're in smaller companies or in the early stages of a project where you have lots and lots of iteration. But even if you're working at a larger company, a bit more stable company where people are in more defined roles, I still think it's important to acquire some engineering skills along the way. It'll help you better understand the work of your collaborators and it will enable you to become a much more valuable overall asset to them. Thank you. <laughs>